The example we're covering today can cover freestanding walls, fences that you're designing, uh, signs that you're designing, and all these weird geometries in between. So you're not gonna wanna miss this because it's applicable to so many things that we design every single day as engineers. And did I forget to mention, we're dipping into the IBC and the 716 with this design example. You know it's gonna be good. Let's get started. We have our amazing figure already drawn up for you. The red is our wooden fence that I'm using as the example. We have uh, wood posts at eight feet on center. The wall is seven feet high and uh, the green squiggles are the wind loads that are going to be uh, that we're going to be calculating and then applying to our fence and we in this example are going to be determining uh, the footing size for one of these fence posts. I've given us some site parameters already over to the left hand side. Those are going to be useful as we move through here because the first thing we're going to be doing is designing this per wind load criteria uh, per the provisions of the ASCE 716 and then we're going to be sizing the footing based on the requirements of the IBC. I'm moving quickly through uh, the wind design parameter today because we already have an example up of that. If you want to get more in depth on it, I'll leave a thumbnail up above, but don't go anywhere. Let's finish this example first. This equation right here to find QZ, which is going to be equal to QH, and we need all these K parameters. V we were already given is 110 miles per hour, but this is where you would go to grab this equation. Let's jump back and plug everything in. And there you have it, all of our K values uh, per chapter 26 of the 716. I've given you uh, reference locations next to each one of the uh, units, so you can go back and check those yourself. But we're going to move a little more quickly today. And then V, obviously, in the equation is 110 miles per hour per our parameter above. All of that plugged into the equation uh, gives us a QH equal to 15 pounds per square foot of force. And then again, that's gonna be wind. We'll keep track of that. Next, we need to find G. G is equal to 0 0.85, and that's per section 26.11.1. And now, if we scroll down a little further, we need to start taking a closer look at the full geometry of our wall, and we are gonna jump over now to chapter 29. We don't need to scroll down too far. You'll see right here, we land ourselves at 29.3, design wind loads of solid freestanding walls and solid signs. That's us today. We are gonna be rocking this equation. It gives an uh, equation in pounds and in newtons. And then right below all the variables they provide to us. QH we solved and it says, in accordance with uh, 2610. So that's why we started off in chapter 26. And now we found ourselves applying it in chapter 29 to our type of structure. Gust effect factor G, we just found that uh, 0 0.85. Again, I referenced where you can locate that in the code, but didn't go there specifically today. C sub F, your net force coefficient. We're gonna need to find that in the following figure. And then A sub S is your gross area of uh, solid freestanding sign, and we'll get to that in a second. We are going to find ourselves at these diagrams. This is figure 29.3-1 uh, that was called out above in order to find C sub F for your freestanding walls. And they give you a visual up here of everything going on. And they actually give you three cases, case A, B, and C. Normally, you would have to uh, test each case and each case will give you different C sub F values, but you can see there's different loading assumptions for each case. So it can, it can vary and depend. Today, for this example, we're only gonna be focusing on case A, which for a freestanding fence kind of at somebody's house, that's probably fine. I would also argue that case C should be, uh, should be looked at. I think those values are gonna get you higher pressures but for simplicity's sake today, we're only doing case A. Uh, if you want to discuss and you think that's a huge problem, leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on these three cases, all right? But with this, you have all your notations from the figures above, and then we need to just apply those uh, notations into this table in order to find our C sub F value. That means we need first an aspect ratio of B over S, and we're like, well, what's B and what's S? Right here, there's B. Right here, there's S. If that didn't do it for you, 
We scroll back up and here's B and here's S. We denoted that the full length was 50 feet and we know we have a fence height of seven feet. So that means B over S is 50 over seven, which equals 7.14. Well, what else do we need to find here? On our left-hand side, we have clearance ratio, ratio, S over H. S we already know is seven, but what's H? H is the height of the sign right here. Well, the height of the sign is also uh, the same thing as the height of the wall because um, there's, no, there's no gap in between here. I know if we flip back um, in my beautiful 3D image here, you're saying, well, Rich, like you drew, there's a little gap below there. Again, for simplicity's sake today, I drew my picture just too well. Let's just assume that wall goes all the way down to the ground surface, okay? So there's no gap in between. And with that, that means that H is also equal to seven feet. S over H is seven over seven, which equals 1.0. That leaves us here with this. I'm gonna scroll a little further. And a B over S of 7.4, which lands us somewhere here in the middle, pretty, pretty close to the middle, actually. And that means we're gonna scroll all the way over, find ourselves somewhere right in here, between three, uh, between 1.35 and 1.3. I think conservatively we can say 1.33 is gonna be good, and that value corresponds to our C sub F value. Let's take that info back, and let's plug everything into the equation that uh, chapter 29 gave us for our freestanding uh, fence wall, okay? We can actually solve our, our equation right now, and I know you're looking at me saying, well, wait a minute, we don't have the surface area, or at least why haven't you put that in yet? If you plug in the surface area in this equation, that will end up giving you a force. It will give you, you know, 2,000 pounds, and that's, that's okay to do that, but that gives you um, the total uh, force acting on this entire length of wall right here. But today we're sizing each post footing, so we need to account for the amount of tributary width each post is supporting. Um, so a little nice little trick to do is not insert uh, your area right now and leave that out and what that will do is calculate the design the final design pressure um, that you can then apply to whatever surface area that you need to so our pressure equals 17 psf we are going to keep this in asd which means that our load case is just 0.6 wind which means our factored pressure is equal to 10.2 psf now let's determine what our trib is and get our surface area um, so that we can then get our load on our post and then design our footing from there. Posts are spaced eight feet on center, which means that we have a trib of eight feet for one post. Four foot on each side of the post equaling eight feet. So if I draw a post for us now, we have a line load on our post, which is seven feet high of W. And W is gonna equal 10.2 PSF times a trib of eight feet which we'll is get us a line load on the post equal to, I'm gonna round up to 82 PLF, which is that right there. In order to design a, a post footing per the IBC, we actually need to combine that load together to get us a, a point load on our post. And we need to determine where that point load P needs to be put on our post. This will make sense in a second when we get into the equation for the footing design. In order to find this height x, first we need to find p. Well, the sum of the lateral forces acting on that post is equal to p, which means that p is equal to 82 PLF times seven feet, which equals 574 pounds. Now you need to determine what is the maximum moment at the top of this footing or at the where the uh, fence post meets the ground. So right here, M, well that M under the distributed load would be equal to 82 PLF times the height of seven feet squared over two. And that's just your cantilevered uh, moment equation for an evenly distributed load along that cantilever. There's nothing crazy about that. That gets you a moment equal to 2,009 pound feet. 
And now to find x, you need to put that force, that point load P high enough so that it generates the same moment at the base as the distributed load along the post does. And by doing that, we know that P times X needs to be set equal to M. That gets you an X equal to 3.5 feet. Which is that number right there. Again, go with me on this. You'll see now why this is important. Now we're jumping in and switching gears to the IBC. And we're gonna find ourselves in 1807.3, embedded posts and poles. And if we go a step further, we're gonna find ourselves in two types of scenarios. You have a post foundation that is unconstrained, and then you have a post condition that is constrained. For us today, we are looking at the non-constrained case. Um, and what that has to do is determining if your footing is pinned, uh, is properly secured at the top of its base. Um, and for us, since this is just kind of like a wood fence, we are assuming that that wood fence is just in a grass field, which means that there's nothing around it structural that can pin the top and restrain your footing. And you'll see the following formula shall be used in determining the depth of embedment required to resist lateral loads with lateral constraint is not provided um, at the ground surface, such as by a rigid floor or a rigid ground surface pavement. So they give you two kind of examples as uh, objects that could constrain your base, but we don't have those. So this gives us an equation that solves the required depth of our footing. And then here's all your uh, variables within that equation. There's a sub equation here to find capital A, which has its own set of variables. Again, they're all defined. Something that stinks with the IBC. You may be saying, hey, I don't see S sub one. You have to scroll down past this big table and S sub one is right there and just defined right there. Um, and actually, let's find S sub one first because this is kind of an iterative process where you have to go back and forth. Um, so you'll see why. Well, S sub one is the allowable lateral soil bearing pressure set forth in section 1806.2 based on a depth of one third the depth of embedment in pounds per square foot. In table 1806.2, this gives you values for your lateral bearing pressure of your foundation. For us today, we're gonna assume class four, there's no rhyme or reason to it, it's just it's dependent upon your soil class that you're designing for. And for us, I, I'm assuming a, a decent soil class, but not the greatest in the world. So we need to use 150 and keep track of the units. PSF per foot below natural grade. And there's another little kicker here for us today. We get a little help. Increase for poles. I would say uh, we have a pole foundation that we're designing or a post, if you want to call it that, and isolated uh, poles for uses such as flagpoles or signs and poles used to support buildings that are not adversely affected by a one half inch motion at the ground surface due to short term lateral loads shall be permitted to be designed using lateral bearing pressure equal to two times the tabulated value. For us, this is a fence. It can move, it can rotate a little bit, a half inch. It's not gonna hurt anybody in short term events. That means this two times, we can hit this value times two. So we now get to use 300 PSF per foot below natural grade as our value for S1, but we still haven't solved S1 completely yet. It's actually equal to 300, that value right there, times one third the depth of embedment of our footing. Um, since this is Boston, to get below the frost line, the minimum depth to bottom of footing needs to be four feet. So let's try four feet, okay? Let's, so we're starting with a value, we're gonna go through and we're gonna see if that checks out. If not, we need to do the iterative process and try again with another value. So four feet, that means four foot depth, but we take one third of that design depth. So four over three, multiplied by this value. That is equal to 400 PSF for S1. Phew, a lot to do there, I know, but we've done the hard one. From here, let's solve capital A, this subvalue equation. P is just the applied lateral force in pounds, so there's that P value that I said we had to apply 
uh, and you know create kind of um, from our loading. And uh, then just B, and B is the diameter of a round post or footing or diagonal dimension of a square post or footing. We have a round footing today. So again, let's assume, let's assume uh, an 18 inch diameter footing. Uh, let's make sure that we keep that in feet. So that's a one and a half foot diameter footing. And now let's take all of that back and solve for A. 2.24. Back in the IBC, we have our final equation, which now we have all of our parameters um, besides one, I guess, H, and H is the distance in feet from ground surface to point of application of P. Remember, we already solved that. That's why I made you do all that funky jazz stuff at the beginning. H we know is equal to three and a half feet. So we have everything. I threw some colors in because keep track of those parentheses. You can let them get away from you pretty quickly if you don't look closely. D is equal to 4.25 feet. Now we ran through all these calculations assuming a depth of four feet. So um, with a 18 inch diameter footing, that means that the four feet that we assumed is smaller than the required depth based on the parameters we use, which means that we need to either increase uh, our footing diameter or increase the depth of our footing. And you can mix and match between the two of those to, to vary your results. So you can get a more shallow footing, but a bigger footing, or you can get a more slender footing, but, but deeper. That's the iterative process back and forth. And remember, your S1 value is gonna change based on the depth of your assumed footing. Um, your then A value changes, and your A value can change based on the diameter of your footing. And then also D equation changes based on those parameters as well. So it all kind of jumbles around. For us today, 4.25 feet, I can then confidently say, okay, we're gonna keep the diameter the same at 18 inches, but we're gonna use a depth of 4.25 feet because I know that by increasing the depth, that only increases my S1 value, which then uh, ultimately helps out and would then yield a slightly smaller D. So I can say that I can use the value uh, that we calculated of 4.25 feet. It's not gonna make the most sense what I just said, unless you yourself run through the iterative process and explore. It's really the only way that I can describe it. Um, it's kind of funky. If someone has a better explanation, leave it down below. I'd love to hear your feedback and comments back to see how everyone else does it. But for today, as you can see, this is our post footing design for a freestanding wall or fence. Um, that's a crash course on it. There's a bunch of other, uh, you know, configurations and geometries and everything under the sun that you could interpret it, whether you have, you know, a highway sign or you have um, a fence that has a gap below it, or you have some type of weird geometry that's in between, chapter 29 in terms of wind loading criteria covers all of that. I hope you had a great time today. This is a great little example, diving into a little bit of wind, a little bit of IBC, a little bit of 716. If you like the content, if you learned something, you know, leave a like. It helps us out tremendously. It helps us reach more engineers. You've heard me say all this before, but I really do mean it. And if you found yourself on this channel multiple times and you haven't yet, now is the time to subscribe. Join the team. What are you waiting for? Join a group of engineers from around the world who are trying to better themselves, uh, better their trade, and better their ability to design the built environment around them. This is Rich with Team Kesteva. I will be traveling for the holidays, so you might get reduced videos, but just know that I will be back at it, cranking away. I hope everyone has a great holiday, whatever you celebrate, and I'll see everybody next time. Later.